Welcome to the Better Questions Podcast. In this episode, we are talking with Dr. Larry Hurtado, and man, this is a great episode in which we're talking with him about the question, is Jesus God? And uh, if you don't know, Dr. Hurtado is a retired professor of New Testament language, literature, and theology, and in his retirement, he continues to pursue his research interests in the areas of New Testament and Christian origins. And uh, just so you know, as you listen, we started out in our normal format, wanting to weave the conversation, uh, talking solely about, is Jesus God? But as we, as we kept going and talking, some other things came to light, and we decided to steer it a little differently. And so as you listen, just keep in mind, we're going to start talking about, is Jesus God? Then we get into how the early church, remember, he's a professor of, and researches Christian origins. And so we talked about how the early church would have considered that question. And then because we know that's such a hot button issue, we wanted to steer the episode at the end to talking about unity in the faith, because Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane himself prays that we all would be one in the same way that he and the Father are one. So how can we disagree well, and how can we strive for unity between all the denominations and all the division in the church today? Yeah, it was really interesting because, like you said, we set out to talk about one question, is Jesus God? And we did talk about that question for a while, but we really ended up talking about how do we see the way that the early church functioned when it came to pursuing unity and what can we learn from that today? Also in this episode, Andrew wasn't present, so we actually accomplished something in the conversation <laughs> and we were able to, to stay on track and stay focused. Yeah, and one of my favorite parts of this episode, actually, Dr. Hurtado, uh, as almost an aside, gives the true definition of the word heretic. You're not going to want to miss hearing that, so please listen. And uh, if you're interested in this podcast and you would like to hear more, please consider subscribing and ringing the bell on YouTube to be notified each time we release an episode. And uh, please consider donating to our Patreon page. Uh, even $1 a month can go a long way toward helping keeping this show free and uh, free forever. So here it is, our interview with Dr. Larry Hurtado. So, Dr. Hurtado, thanks again for joining us and being with us here on the podcast. And I just thought we could start um, with you telling us a little bit about yourself and the focus of your scholarly work right now. Um, as of this moment, uh, since 2011, I've been um, uh, retired from my professor chair at the University of Edinburgh. So, I'm professor emeritus right now in the university. Um, so, I work from home, um, but I'm still active in um, in research and scholarly activities. Um, had a bit of a slowdown because uh, last summer I was diagnosed with leukemia. And oh, no. uh, underwent about uh, uh, nearly three months of intensive um, chemotherapy and hospitalization, uh, which sort of uh, required me to shut down everything. Uh, and since then, I've been slowly gaining strength and um, weight and hair back again uh, and, uh, and able to return to a bit of... Um, academic uh, work, but uh, not at the same pace. So I, I, I'm not accepting the same number of um, commissions or commitments that I did before. Wow. Uh, so sorry to hear that. The focus of my work, I suppose, um, I, I'm a bit um, uh, eclectic in some sense. Uh, every, as I wrote when I was in the universities, I wrote on my web page about myself, uh, anything connected with the origins of Christianity is of interest to me. And it's difficult to resist sort of putting your finger into almost anything to find out about it, at least. Um, the areas in which I've tried to make a contribution are probably um, three, I guess I would say. One is um, which originated with my doctoral thesis, and I, I still have some uh, uh, elements of, of um, investigation there is in, is in textual criticism of the New Testament. And that related over, uh, developed over also into an interest in 
the material remains of manuscripts as physical um, objects of early Christianity. Uh, indeed, amongst our earliest um, archaeological artifacts are actually these uh, fragmentary manuscripts, which are often not regarded as artifacts. Uh, but my point, one of the things I've been trying to establish for a number of years now, is that they're not only copies of text, but they're also physical objects, and that their physical characteristics tell us something about how they were used, who used them, and therefore something about uh, the way these texts were used and regarded in early Christianity. So that's that's one area. Oh, wow. Another area that I've made some occasional contributions in is the Gospel of Mark, an early commentary on it from 30 years ago, I guess, and and, and occasional um uh, subsequent essays, uh, but probably the main page count, I suppose, over the last um, 30 years or more has been on what I've called uh, devotion to Jesus in early Christianity, looking at the place of Jesus in early Christian belief, but also uh, emphasizing very much uh, the importance of the devotional actions or ritual actions uh, f with Jesus as the recipient or object of it. And, and the importance of those things in telling us uh, something of um, of how Jesus functioned in their lives. This is, of course, the in the post Easter period, particularly. Gotcha. Wow, that's that's all so interesting. Thank you. I, I've never thought about the manuscripts in that way before, and that's uh, man, that would be a whole other episode, I think, in and of itself. So that's very interesting. Um, but I uh, I listened to a few other interviews that you have done um, in preparation, and in one of them, you mentioned that you like to start your scholarly work with a question. And because our show is the Better Questions podcast, I just thought we could start um, asking you how important questions are to you, and specifically finding the right questions that lead to the best um, scholarly work. Well, I think that all good scholarship, all good uh, research in any field is, um, is fueled by questions and curiosity. I've heard scientists talk about what drives them, and uh, they basically say the same thing. You know, that why is this so, or how does this work? And um, uh, the difference, of course, is that in, in the experimental sciences, you can go to the bench and you can perform a set of experiments and satisfy yourself um, theoretically. Uh, whereas in historical work, such as I do, you're, um, you're a prisoner of the remains of, of what evidence there is. So a lot more of the work involves um, making uh, the best inferences you can based on the available data. But yes, I think in every case, uh, questions are crucial. So when I used to supervise PhD students, they would often arrive and I would say, okay, remind me what it is you want to work on. And they would say something like, um, I'm going to, I'd be interested in working on, um, you know, the church in Paul. And I would say, I'm sorry, that's not a thesis. A thesis is an answer to a question. What is your question about the church in Paul or whatever? So um, uh, that's, that's, the, that's how you sharpen research. Is, um, it's not simply writing a bunch of stuff about something you've read, but trying to answer a question. Yeah. Do you ever get a ways into your research and realize that you're maybe even operating or starting from an incorrect assumption in your question and you need to even change your question a little bit? That can happen, yes. Um, I mean, you, if you can say why is something so, and then you get into it and you realize actually there isn't a whole lot of evidence for that, uh, then that's obviously a kind of dead-end question. Uh, and then, of course, you can generate a new question, which is why did I and perhaps many other scholars think that it was so when the evidence doesn't say that it is? So there's, there's a, ch a shift in question that you can pursue. As you've been doing work on um, Christian origins and especially how G the idea and devotion to Jesus functioned within that, what are some of the questions that you've been seeking to answer? Probably the, the original uh, question that I started off with on that line of research back in, um, ooh, really back in the late 70s, I guess, uh, was uh, how did a Jewish um, figure from uh, Galilee, um, who obviously made an impression on his immediate followers and on his enemies. I mean, when you, when you have people who are willing to forsake their livelihoods on the one hand, and other people who wish to execute you on the other hand, you've obviously made an impact, uh, both positive and negative. So already during his ministry he did, uh, but uh, that's still within reason, so to speak. But how is it that this figure then so very quickly, it seems uh, after 
uh, his execution uh, comes to be treated as worthy of divine honors, uh, treated virtually as a kind of divinized figure. Well, what, ha what happened? Uh, when did it happen? Where did it happen? How quickly did it happen? All those associated questions. Those were originally questions that, um, that were formulated and addressed initially by uh, a group of scholars in the early 20th century uh, uh, in Germany and uh, called the, the, the History of Religion School, uh, headquartered in Göttingen University. And um, the classic work on that subject was published in 1913 by a guy named Wilhelm Busset called Kyrios Christos. And that was his sort of full-scale attempt to try to answer all of those questions. It was translated into English in 1970, and I, as a graduate student, was reading it back then and um, was fascinated with the quality of what he'd done, but also dissatisfied with uh, some of the stuff that he'd assumed that I knew had subsequently been shown to be uh, not the case. So I simply took over those same questions and thought to myself, we need to have another go at it. And um, that's where I'd, I've, I've been located uh, in, in pursuing those questions then for the, for the last 30 years or so. Pursuing those questions and then defending the answers that I came up with. Yeah. So when you uh, think about especially in the context of what you've studied and learned and done scholarship work on throughout your career. Um, if you ever come across just, let's say, lay people in Christianity and, and you hear them speak, what are some of the least helpful or maybe most misguided questions you hear the, the collective group of Christianity asking um, that you really wish they knew more about the subjects in which they're asking, if that makes sense? What are some of the least helpful questions you hear Christians ask? Gosh. Um, well, one question that I've mentioned that, that it seems to me is understandable, but uh, as a scholar, it seems to me is insufficiently um, carefully framed, is people will say, you know, if they, if they find out the sort of historical investigation that I've been doing into Jesus' devotion, and if they hear anything of it, they'll say, so, is Jesus God? And... Um, I have to say, well, it, it all depends on what you mean by the question. The question itself is not terribly clear. Um, uh, and so if you mean, for example, do you mean the figure we formerly knew as God is now to be understood as Jesus? Absolutely not. No, no way. Mm -hmm. um, if you mean that Jesus sort of overwrites Jesus, so to speak, uh, Jesus overwrites God uh, in, in some kind of fulsome way, no. Uh, the New Testament and early Christian literature and all the classical creeds make a distinction between God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, number one, and then Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, number two. So there's an undeniable two-ishness uh, and distinction uh, between uh, the God of the Old Testament and uh, Jesus. At the same time, uh, Jesus and God are uniquely and inextricably linked together in such a way that uh, the New Testament also says, uh, it seems to me cumulatively, that in the present situation, um, it is impossible to describe God adequately or worship God adequately without including Jesus in the equation as well. But not by replacing God with Jesus, but by adding him in. So this produces, um, as they say, you know, the, the lay term would be a kind of two-ishness, uh, or the more formal term I've used is, you know, a kind of dyadic picture of um, God and and the shape of early Christian worship. So as you really started to go down that route and wrestle with this question of how did uh, how did this this figure Jesus come to be known as God? What are some things that you found along that way that maybe really surprised you? Surprising. Well, yes. Well, I guess I guess. Um, uh, one of the things early on was that um, uh, in in Bousset's book and in and in uh, the great majority of scholarship up to that time, which is to say up until probably sometime in the 70s, virtually everybody believed, it seems, that um, this uh, expression, the Son of Man, which is used so frequently in the Gospels um, as a kind of self-referential expression by Jesus, that this tar term... Uh, must have been there in the Jewish context of Jesus' time, so that he must have been referring to a well-known title and a well-known figure. And then the only question became, 
could Jesus have done this? Could he have referred to himself by reference to this well-known figure or not? And some people said, yes, he must have. And other people said, no, that's impossible. That's, that's kind of crazy to think that he would have done that. But everybody agreed that there was such a figure that was known by the title, son of, the Son of Man, in Second Temple Judaism. And the question was, when Jesus, you know, did Jesus use this expression of himself, or did he use it with reference to that figure as a third party, as a third person? Sometime, by sometime in the 1970s, although there had been the occasional squeaks of misgiving earlier, by the 19, early, early mid-1970s, scholars began uh, producing publications that showed that actually a thorough scouring of the Second Temple Jewish evidence shows there ain't no such thing. Hmm. There is no evidence of the use of the Son of Man as a title in that form for anybody. It doesn't exist at all. And so that called into question a lot of things. And so then, you know, I and other people really sort of had to scratch our heads and say, okay, that, that's interesting. That's a, <laughs> the question is not, did Jesus use this of himself or, and claim to be the son of man of this well-known figure, or did he use it of another figure? Both questions are irrelevant, and the question becomes then, okay, if it wasn't a title well-known, uh, then uh, how did it appear in the Gospels with such frequency? And um, so that's the kind of question that I had to devote myself to for a while. Um, the all, also, um, there were other interesting things that developed in about that same period. Uh, one view was that, um, you know, that uh, Jews didn't tend to refer to God in Aramaic uh, with the Aramaic term for Lord, uh, the term Mare. And uh, sometime in the 1970s, again, it happens that uh, certain texts from Qumran, from the Dead Sea Scrolls, were discovered in which it's evident that uh, the Aramaic term Mare is used occasionally as a way of uh, addressing God as Lord in Aramaic, just as Adonai is used in Hebrew. So uh, various kind of discoveries that uh, in that, particularly in the, in the 70s and 80s, that kind of reopened uh, what had been thought to be conventionally closed issues, broke the ground open for a whole new uh, investigation. Um, and it was, I suppose, in some cases surprising, but more often, um, gee, this is really exciting. This, this offers an opportunity for really going at the question afresh. That makes sense. Um, I wanted to kind of go back to something you said before about the Son of Man and ask, because I've heard people say that Jesus was obviously referencing something in, I believe it's Daniel, where there's a vision, uh, and it says, I think if I'm quoting it right, it's like, and... Um, they see a vision of heaven and, and someone like the Son of Man descending. And um, I just wondered if you could kind of explain, because I know maybe some of our listeners at that point might be thinking the same thing. So I wondered if you can kind of explain that. Yeah, the, the figure in Daniel 7, the phrasing is that, that he sees what he calls the Ancient of Days, which uh, pretty much everybody believes is God. And then he sees another figure approach the Ancient of Days, and he says, I saw one like a Son of Man. So the title is not used there, uh, like a son of man is a descriptive phrase. And that phrase, a son of man, or its equivalent in Hebrew or, or Greek, is used um, uh, oodles of times in the Old Testament. It's, it's a standard Semitic way of referring to a human being uh, in, a, in a little more elevated sort of form. I mean, you can refer to a human being as an ish, or you, you know, man, or you can say um, uh, uh, Ben Adam, uh, son of son of Adam or son of man. It's a little more elevated way of referring to it, a little semi, almost semi-poetical, but it's a common Semitic expression. Um, but the point is that the the title or the formulation "the Son of Man" is not used either in Daniel or in any other um, of the ancient uh, Jewish texts. So, uh, nevertheless, some people would say, "Well, okay, when um, if, if uh, as I think probably." Hard to say. Maybe I'd say that the majority of scholars uh, uh, think that Jesus did use the expression uh, "the Son of Man" in Aramaic, probably "bar and uh, That he may have been alluding to that figure, you know. So it, he may have been using it in the sense of "I am the Son of Man." Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. You know, the one in Daniel described as one like a son of man, and that's uh, that's a view that is held by some scholars. Um, the um, the other view which um, uh, I think is probably a little more probable, is that uh, Jesus used the expression, coined it as a, a kind of distinctive self-reference, uh, but that the emphasis uh, in adding the, the equivalent of a definite article to it, or the, or the definite state in Aramaic, uh, 
is to say that uh, he is not simply a son of man, but the son of man. That is, uh, mm. it adds a note of strong particularity to him and is perhaps just simply reflective of a sense of a distinctive calling and a unique um, role in salvation history. Be uh, part of the reason I feel that way is that if you go through looking at the 70 or 80 or so uses of son of man in the Gospels, only about three or four of them uh, really require or, or exhibit any direct reference to the passage in Daniel 7, um, and most of them don't. And so um, it's a toss-up. Do you think he was always alluding to that passage, and in some cases overtly and in other cases not? Or uh, is it simply a more um, uh, self, you know, a unique sort of self-referential expression that he chose uh, simply in order to express in some kind of veiled way uh, the sense of a particularity to his mission, distinctiveness to his sense of mission. Wow, thanks for that. Um, I, I really would love to ask some follow-up on the whole conversation about Jesus as God, because it's really fascinating to me. So it seems like, depending who you ask, people are all over the camp on that question. So you maybe have a scholar like... Um, Bart Ehrman, who'd say, well, none of Jesus's early followers thought he was God. Jesus didn't think he was God. And this is an idea that Christians developed much later. You'd have other people saying, well, if you just kind of read between the lines, it's all over the text in scripture, the idea of equating Jesus with God. How would you say that how would you say this idea developed, and when would you say this idea developed? Well, again, I think I'd have to quibble over the question or the statement. Um, the New Testament uh, language, if you just go reading through it, 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 it characteristically uh, reserves the word theos for God, <laughs> uh, which in, in, in later Christian terminology is, is, I suppose, in Trinitarian terms, God the Father. Uh, and Jesus, the characteristic honorific term that is used for Jesus in the New Testament is the term Kyrios, or Lord. And so, you know, for example, the opening of, of Paul's letters, grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and the Lord, Jesus Christ. So uh, it appears that Paul and many of the New Testament writers actually use the word Theos and Kyrios as a way of distinguishing two figures. At the same time, when you look at the, um, the warp and woof of what they write, and also the nature of their devotional practice, worship practice, these two figures, which, as they say, they keep distinct, are also closely linked together, both in the way they talk about them and in the way in which they worship and, and reverence them. Um, and so, uh, you know, so, for example, in, in Ehrman's book, uh, which I, I reviewed some time back, but he makes statements like, looking at a, at a New Testament passage, and he'll say, Jesus is not yet God Almighty here. Well, he never is. He never is. In the fourth century creeds, as they say, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. That's one thing. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. That's a second one. God, the Father Almighty is one thing. Christ is not referred to as God, the Father Almighty. He never does become that. So, so you have to say, yeah, Bart, you're absolutely right. It's not there in the New Testament or anywhere else in Christian tradition. Properly understood. Um, now, in a lot of popular Christian piety, however, and I, of course what I'm talking about are the New Testament writings and creedal formulations and um, sort of, you know, uh, scholarly Christian thought, that distinction is maintained. Both distinction and close association, both things have to be said at the same time. So, for example, opening words of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You can't read one half of that without the other. He was both with God and was God. And you think, well, how can he be with God if he was God? There's the clue. It's not a simple one-for-one -one equation. It's something more complex than that. And that complexity is what preoccupied Christians for the better part of three to 400 years. It wasn't that they were stupid. It was that there, there was a real complexity to try to solve, and they worked at it as best they could with the philosophical categories of the ancient world. Uh, which, by the way, are not ours, and so we may have to go at it again in our own terms today. But um, that you have two things that have to be held together, as I say, both a distinction between God the Father and Jesus, and a indissoluble uh, linkage and a unique linkage of the two. So I would I would want to say that to people and try to clarify it. Um, 
the question the, what what happens though if you if you want if you mean by that when does jesus start to be linked with god in such a way that he is um for example identified with certain old testament passages and this is one of the remarkable things is that texts in the old testament that originally refer to god the, the jewish uh, yahweh uh several of these texts are actually read as applicable to jesus i mean for example in the gospel of john chapter 12 the author relates how jesus makes his triumphal entry into jerusalem and he re re recounts the events there and then at a certain point he says you know people didn't uh, believe and he says um, isaiah spoke of this when he saw his glory and spoke of him now the text that he's obviously referring to is isaiah chapter 6 where isaiah says i saw the lord high and lifted up and uh, ordinary reading of the passage and i think everybody's reading of the passage down until early Christianity was that what he saw was God. John is absolutely convinced that what uh, what Isaiah portrays in Isaiah chapter 6 is a kind of proleptic uh, vision of the glorified, exalted Jesus sitting at the right hand of God in heaven. There are other examples of this where New Testament writers will take an Old Testament text that refers originally to God and apply it to Jesus. Um, but also in the realm of worship practices, um, the early Christians baptized in the name of Jesus. This is sort of a unique ritual act. Baptism isn't, but baptizing in the name of a figure such as Jesus is a unique thing. It means that you're being uh, initiated into a community that is identified by the figure of Jesus and you in a distinctive kind of way. Uh, the meal that they celebrate is described as a meal in which uh, Jesus is the presiding kyrios, the presiding Lord at the meal. Like the cult meals of pagan deities where you have Serapis or some other deity imagined as being present for the early Christians such as Paul uh, Jesus is the the Lord who is present at the meal giving it a kind of um, Sacred significance and so on. So when does this happen? Well, the answer seems to be it happens from within the earliest moments after Jesus execution because in Paul's letters a whole pattern of um, uh, sort of honorific language used for Jesus, such as the title Kyrios and the use of these Old Testament passages and these devotional actions are all presented, never explained. They're just taken for granted. And um, so it, we have to presume that they were something that he didn't figure was very, very controversial amongst his uh, followers and amongst other Christians as well. Moreover, the indications that we have from his letters is that these same sorts of practices and similar kind of honorific language characterized Aramaic Jewish speaking believers as well as Greek speaking Gentile believers. And um, Paul underwent the religious experience that changed him from an opponent of the early Jesus movement to uh, an enthusiastic um, proponent of it. Uh, by common convention, somewhere within um, a couple of years at most after Jesus execution, so somewhere in the 30s. And uh, it appears as though at the point when he makes his religious change, the form of uh, faith that he's introduced to is a form that is pretty much the kind that he attests in his, in his letters. So we have to say then that this um, development of treating Jesus as sharing in some way, now the question is in some way, what does that mean? That takes Christians, as say, several centuries to figure out how to express that. But in some real way, sharing in the divine name, in the divine throne, and in the divine glory, and therefore uh, uh, worthy of, uh, of being included in the Christian practice of worship. When does that happen? It seems to have happened uh, within um, a few years, or perhaps even a few months at most, uh, after Jesus' execution. And it seems to have happened originally in Jewish Judean circles, Aramaic-speaking and Greek-speaking Jewish circles in Roman Judea. Man, that that is awesome. Um, and it makes me think, you know, saying that that Jesus it's more complicated basically that Jesus is both linked with God and yet distinct in the scriptures um, and I think to further complicate it where it makes takes my mind is when he's in the garden in John and he prays that we would be one in the same way that he and the father are one because that's where people usually point, you know, I and the Father are one, and they get this idea that, okay, well, that means Jesus is God. But then he says, in the same way that we are one, or maybe you might say linked, let the church be linked together 
that they may be unified. And that's kind of one of the hearts behind our podcast, which is, yeah, okay, we all have these different perspectives, but how can we really be unified in the way that, that Christ prayed about? And so, which leads me to this question. In uh, some interviews, I've heard you talk about uh, what you call divergent clusters of Christianity. And they have differing differing views and interpretations of Christianity. But how, how do you think we could go about finding unity between uh, these divergent clusters of different beliefs? Or can we? Uh, I think... Whether we can, I, I think in principle, yes. The question is, are people willing to exercise um, the actions that are that are necessary in order to effect it? Um, two comments. One, uh, I've argued that uh, in my book, Lord Jesus Christ, uh, in in defining what I and and people like Bart Ehrman and other people define as proto orthodoxy, um, or sort of early stages of what becomes Orthodox Catholic Great Church Christianity. But when you look closely at it, it's not one thing. It's a it's a clutch of things. Uh, it's a it's a diversity of things. I mean, even the New Testament shows that. I mean, when you have in the New Testament uh, declared as canon and scripture, uh, four gospels with their very different portraits of Jesus, and in the same New Testament collection, the epistles of Paul and James and Peter and John, which which do very which do very different things, not necessarily contradictory, although at times you may think so. But certainly very different things. Uh, the New Testament, the DNA, the architectural structure of the New Testament witnesses to a critical diversity, not a uniformity. And right. um, so if we, if we simply go to the shape and dimensions and architecture of the New Testament, we are bound to say at the earliest get-go and the, and the canonical formation is one that, that should institute a certain amount of what I call critical diversity right at the core of Christian practice and belief. Not a uniformity. Um, And the proto-Orthodox Christians, in the early second, mid-second century at least, are those Christians who are ready to recognize that and accept it. The groups that we call heretics, and keep in mind the original meaning of the word hieresis, is heretics, tend to be those who say, no, it either has to be my way or the highway. You either have to agree with me or you're out. Or we're out. We won't stay with you blockheads that won't see things our way. <laughs> so such as the, the, the secessionists who are mentioned in 1 John. You know, 1 John complains about those who went out from us. And um, uh, he's really angry and hurt over that. Because, uh, notice, they haven't been kicked out. They walked out because those to whom the author of John writes wouldn't go along with their point of view. Um, but at, at, at its early stage... Proto-Orthodoxy is a diversity. One of the texts that I think uh, from within the canon that I point to often is the passage in Ephesians uh, chapter 4, which begins with a statement, strive to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, forbearing and forgiving one another in love. And then it talks about, because you are really one, you know, one faith, one Lord, one baptism, so on, so on, so on. And then it says, until we attain the unity of the faith. Mm. So notice the sequence. The command is to maintain the unity of the spirit now until we attain the unity of the faith, then at some point in God's future, probably not until the beatific vision. Uh, We have tended to reverse that. We have tended in the history of Christianity to say we first must iron out our differences doctrinally, and then we can have fellowship with one another. Mm. And if we can't agree with one another, then we can't even have communion together, which is supposed to be the sign of Christian unity, not uniformity, unity. But we've tended to reverse that sequence. But the sequence in Ephesians is, no, you strive to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of love, forbearing and forgiving one another now, which presupposes argument, difference, diversity. I mean, you don't have to forbear anybody who is intelligent enough to agree with you. <laughs> you only have to forbear one another, which means putting up with someone. You only have to forbear and forgive someone who's a total blockhead and who insists on seeing something differently than the way you know is right. So, uh, but, the, but the scriptural command is in those circumstances to forbear and forgive. It doesn't mean you have to agree with them, but you maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. You keep on arguing with each other. Uh, you keep on wrestling with each other uh, the, way, uh, the way people do who respect each other. 
until you find unity of the of, of the faith, which is probably not going to come until the revelation of Christ. So, are we willing to do that? Uh, well, you know, if you want a so-called pure church and you want pure doctrine, it ain't going to happen. Uh, if you insist on uniformity of faith, it ain't going to happen, ever. We'll go on being split and torn and rent. And ironically, as I say, Holy Communion, which is supposed to be the ritual by which we agree uh, that we're all striving to be brothers and sisters, uh, Holy, even Holy Communion is torn and rent and split, and people won't even have Holy Communion with each other unless they first agree to all their doctrinal standards. That's it seems to me is a is a, is a heartbreaking um, situation. So I don't know. the The answer to your question is if people are willing. <laughs> I'll put it this way: if people are willing to obey the scriptural text, then yes, it is possible. If people insist on disobeying the scriptural text and thinking that doctrinal uniformity is some necessary thing before uh, before uh, uh, fellowship can be take place, then, then it won't happen. Do you think that it's accurate that a lot of the problems we have in the church today around some of these issues that you just mentioned were similar problems that the early church faced? And if so... How, how did the early church go about those problems that maybe we can learn from today? Well, it's evident that there were differences in, <clears throat> in the early situation. Um, the letters of Paul, of course, reveal um, some uh, differences and uh, some cases quite sharp ones. Uh, some of the uh, language that Paul uses, which you might even regard as intemperate and unfortunate language, uh, referring to uh, people certain people as false apostles, as apostles of Satan, as dogs. Um, so clearly, um, uh, as I say, there's a critical inclusiveness, and certainly Paul comes down on the critical side of things. Uh, but the reason for, in that case, the reason for his um, sharp and perhaps even intemperate language is because the people he's there targeting are people who refuse to accept the diversity that he's arguing for. <laughs> I mean, he's arguing that Jewish believers should go on being Jewish. So, I, so he argues that Jewish believers in Jesus should continue to be Jews, not, not um, de-Judaize. That means they should continue to circumcise their sons. They should continue to observe Torah. But they must uh, uh, accept non-Jewish Gentile believers as brothers and sisters in Christ, and they must not discriminate against them. And they must allow them to be Gentiles and not require them to be Jews. There you have, again, another example of a kind of quite profound um, inclusive distinction between two kind of um, types of people who, the, the, the family of Abraham that Paul talks about is clearly a multinational family of Abraham, particularly inclusive of Jews who remain Jews, Hebrews of the Hebrews, as Paul calls himself, and people who are non-Jews, who, who eat pork and who um, don't necessarily circumcise their sons and who don't necessarily observe Shabbat and so on. That both have to be accommodated within Christ. And Christ becomes the common denominator for both. And it appears that the people that Paul is condemning so sharply are people who said, can't do that. You either have to be a Jew or become a Jew in order to be fully um, a part of uh, God's family, in, even in Christ. In effect, from Paul's standpoint, what they were saying is Jesus is not enough. You also have to accept Torah. And Paul is saying, no, that, that, won't, that won't wash. You, you, uh. So actually, ironically, the intemperate language that Paul is using there is in defense of a certain critical diversity that he argues for. Um, of course, one of the things that they do is he goes to Jerusalem, he says, in Galatians 2, to try to make sure that the gospel that he preaches and the and the uh, policy that he follows is accepted by, um, by the leadership in Jerusalem and claims that it was. Uh, so they meet, they, they get together, they try to work out their differences. Um, he also says, of course, that there were people there uh, who he calls false brethren, <laughs> who tried to, um, who tried to uh, scuttle the whole thing. And he says, but we, we did not listen to them for a moment. So... Um, there's sharp controversy, and, and the effort to effect some kind of um, critical inclusivity uh, doesn't always succeed with everybody. There are some people who basically say, can't go there, I'm, I'm walking out, and uh, that, that's happened. So I don't know that we can aim for 
a complete success, but we can strive for at least um, as much success as we can get with um, with following that kind of practice, which is um, dialogue. Um, you know, it, it, it tells more about us, not that we have differences. The differences between Christians is not what tells whether we're Christians or not. What tells whether we're true Christians or not is how we handle those differences. And um, uh, it doesn't mean that we mute them or that we swallow them, but that we surface them, we put them on the table, and we reason with one another. And we try to say, you know, what is it in Scripture that makes you think this? Or what is it in Christian tradition or in the exercise of reason today that makes you think that this is so? And the other person has to try to listen as patiently as they can before they try to object to it. And then give their reasons. Um, and uh, that's not going to happen on a, uh, it's probably not going to succeed in uh, resolving those differences in a single seminar. Uh, and it may never resolve all of those differences. But the question is, are you willing to, uh, you know, it's basically a statement about what you think about the character of the other person. You may say, I think they're absolutely crazy. I think they're absolutely nuts in what they say. But I believe that they sincerely want to be a Christian. I trust their character. I think they're, I think they're off their rocker when it comes to what they say in some sense. But I trust their character. I don't believe they're being deceptive or dishonest or conniving or evil in intent. I trust them as a fellow believer, even though I think that they are wrong, wrong, wrong. That's how we exhibit our Christian faith, it seems to me, not in achieving some sort of uniformity in what we say. Yeah, I, I love that the picture you kind of keep pointing back to of what this vision looks like is really around um, communion. And you mentioned earlier about how it's unfortunate today that there there's so many areas in the church where people uh, of differences aren't able to come together and have holy communion. But it also seems like that's not a new problem either. Uh, like even Paul is writing about that in 1 Corinthians, uh, it seems like in 1 Corinthians 11 when he's talking about the issues taking place amongst the believers around communion, but he he's calling them to that unity. And so I guess I'm asking it. What I'm hearing you say is that really what people like Paul are calling out more than anything else is, is people within the church who are not willing to, work toward unity and who are disrupting the idea of unity amongst different beliefs and different concepts. Is that, is that an accurate representation of what you're saying? Yeah, I think that, uh, I think the thing that I would complain about, um, as I've <laughs> put into print, I, I, I plead guilty to being a Christian myself. And, um, and therefore I do have a kind of personal concern, um, about uh, the uh, the way in which we live out uh, Christian life collectively, and I guess the uh, the things that I find uh, distressing are where um, Christians who differ sharply over some often some very important things um, and very neuralgic issues uh, today and 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 in other days as well. That where people have these differences, they um, simply uh, make accusations at one another. They yep. hurl abuse at one another and do not uh, sit down and um, find it so difficult to say, um, uh, okay, uh, I need you to tell me why you believe this crazy stuff. I need you to try to get me to understand, pardon me, what I think is crazy or what I think is wrong or dangerous. Uh, I need you to try to help me to understand how on earth could you reach such a conclusion? What are the factors involved? And then I need to start to examine those and tell you more specifically what I want to raise questions about, where I think you've gone off the rail or where I think that you've made a misstep or whatever. Um, they don't do that very often. Instead, they simply hurl accusations at each other or get out on the streets and wave banners or, or whatever. Um, that's not communication. That's polemics. So that's one thing. And the other thing is that, uh, uh, that people, um, uh, as I say, insist upon some sort of doctrinal uh, uniformity uh, almost before they can even sit down and talk to each other. 
Yep. Um, and um, and use the lack of doctrinal uniformity as a justification for this kind of um, uh, polemical assault upon one another. And it happens on on often on both sides of a given issue. It's not one side or the other. It's often both sides who will uh, simply uh, characterize each other. Um, you know, <laughs> we've spent a lot of time in, I, I had a little introduction to marital counseling when I was studying for the ministry many, many years ago, and I suppose people still do take undertake some of this today. And, you know, one of the things in marital counseling, you're told, is you're never supposed to say things like you always, yep. or you're never supposed to use labels of each other, um, you're supposed to say, you know, when you do this, this is how I feel about that, uh, which isn't condemnatory, whatever. It's just sort of registering that I have a problem with what you do on these occasions. And uh, one could wish that something similar were a kind of, um, uh, a kind of uh, discourse uh, that Christians with differences could take up. Um, ironically, as I say about the Lord's Supper, you know, Christians can't celebrate the Lord's Supper, one of the reasons is because they differ over how to understand the Lord's Supper. How ironic can you get? Right. You know, um, one group says the bread and wine uh, uh, ritually become, sacramentally become the body and blood of Jesus. Another group says no, the body, uh, the body and blood of Jesus are there, but are not directly with the bread and the wine, but are, are, are accompanying it. Another one says, no, there's no body and blood on the table or near it at all, but it is a real presence of Christ in the meal that makes it real. And yet another group says, well, no, it's simply a meal in which we remember the death and resurrection of Jesus and identify ourselves as believers. No two of those people can have communion, no two of those points of view can have communion together, say the people in each case, because we don't understand, we don't agree in understanding how it is the Lord's Supper. We're all agreed it's the Lord's Supper, but we don't agree on how it's the Lord's Supper, so therefore we can't have the Lord's Supper. That's kind of crazy, don't you think? Um, yeah. So I remember when I was pastoring a small church in the Chicago area, I was pals with a Lutheran guy and with a Roman Catholic priest, we got together and or had drinks in the priest's house and so on, had a good time together. And, and on one occasion, I remember saying to him, you know, we should, get to, we should get our people together. We should have a common worship service. And they all said, yeah, that'd be great. And the priest then said, yeah, but we can't have communion together first. And I said, why is that? Well, because, you know, we don't agree on understanding uh, the thing. And, of course, he was, quite honestly, of course, he was bound as a Roman Catholic, could not participate in a, in a non-Catholic communion service. But it's uh, kind of tragic, I think. Um, because I would think that when people get together to argue about their differences, one of the things they should do before they start arguing about their differences is to have Holy Communion together. And, say, awesome. and say, you know, all you have to do is recite uh, the words of the institution from 1 Corinthians 11 or from the Gospels. You don't have to inject into it um, uh, a particular... Now, you must understand that what we're doing here is this... Um, you just uh, recite the words of Scripture and let people in their own hearts uh, decide what they're doing. But the gesture together, uh, eating one bread, communing at one table, is a way of saying before we begin the discussion, uh, we affirm one another as people who want to be Christians. Even if I think you're not doing a very good job of it, I accept that you want to be a Christian. So, Yeah. Man, that's, that is great stuff. And that falls completely in line with... Um the spirit behind our podcast about trying to unify the church. Um, I, I really love a lot of what you said. And to honor your time, we want to wrap up. Uh, we'll probably, I've got one more question, really. And uh, it takes it slightly into a, a different mode, but I think it's related, and we can kind of circle back on it. Which So the question is this. A lot of Christians recoil against the idea of a purality of religious options in society like their outrage at the ten commandments being taken down or things like that um and outraged maybe by the openness of america historically to having you know no set religion so welcoming everyone and i heard you on a podcast talk about this and i thought you could maybe explain why that's misguided in society as a whole and maybe why plurality of religious options can be good but also then, to, to kind of end our time, go then back to the church and 
how can the plurality of options and interpretation within Christianity also be good? Well, to the first question, that is, what kind of social space should we work for, social and political space? I feel quite strongly that for powerful theological and scriptural reasons, Christians must, uh, are obligated really, to work for a social and political space that allows for difference and dissent. If you don't allow for difference and dissent, then you actually, I would argue, are making it more difficult for authentic faith to be exercised. The key thing in the New Testament, of course, is that one is a Christian, one is a follower of Jesus through the exercise of volitional faith. It cannot be constrained uh, at sword point or by other means, but a person must be able to freely embrace uh, the gift of God, which comes from the Spirit, and, uh, and must be embraced and accepted by the individual believer. Um, and in order for that to happen, obviously, there has to be a social and political space where there is no coercion or no um, invalid uh, incentives, you might say. You know, there, you, you can't have rice Christians, so to speak, people who put faith in Jesus in order to get some sort of material advantage or people who do so out of fear that they will be persecuted or abused. So, you know, it was the case in, uh, in some settings where you, you know, if you ran a car dealership and you weren't seen in church on Sunday, you probably wouldn't sell many cars. So you went to church on Sunday whether you wanted to or not because you needed to sell cars. That's a kind of social coercion. And under those circumstances, the guy who goes to church in order to sell cars is obviously not, a, not exercising authentic Christian faith. The person who's going to church in order to be seen and in order to be seen to be socially upright, that ain't the real thing. Uh, so I think that, um, that it's not a, a case of uh, liberal values. It's a case of scriptural values and of strong theological principles saying the, the one thing that we must do is create a situation in which the Holy Spirit can work in the hearts of people freely and can allow them either to obey or to disobey divine conviction. And that's why I say it, it, it must make room for not only diversity, but also dissent. If I do not allow room for somebody to say, uh, to pour rubbish on the gospel, if I do not allow for that to be the case, then, I, then I've actually shut down the opportunity for a person to embrace Christian faith because they want to, not because they feel constrained to. I have, a, uh, I have an article uh, or an essay that's coming out in Marginalia, the uh, Los Angeles Review of Books, at some point in the future in which I try to make that case. Um, as to the dissent among Christians, again, I think that uh, what I said earlier I would come back to, and that is Christian dissent is not the problem. Um, and so we should not be preoccupied with trying to remove all dissent. Uh, the problem is how we handle dissent. Do we handle it in a scriptural manner or do we handle it in an unscriptural manner? Uh, in a scriptural manner, as I say, I would go back to my pack passage in Ephesians. Uh, we handle it in a scriptural manner by maintaining the unity of the Spirit, forbearing and forgiving one another, um, and, uh, and awaiting uh, the unity of the faith at some eschatological moment in the future. Man, it's been so awesome. Chris, I don't know if you have anything else uh, before we wrap up. No, I don't think so. Man, that was some good stuff. I'm just, <laughs> I'm really chewing on that right now. It. If people want to kind of dive more into your work and just really learn more about Christian origins, about uh, early development of the faith, what are um, what what's some of your work that you would point them to? Maybe especially some stuff that you feel like is most accessible. Uh, most recently, I had a little book that appeared um, in in twenty eighteen entitled "Honoring the Sun." Uh, and it's, uh, it's a small, it's only about, I think, 60, 70 pages of text and um, is, is heavily a, a, um, a condensation of my argument uh, for the importance of um, the way in which Jesus is treated in early Christian devotional practice as being an indication of his um, early and surprisingly high status in their, in their beliefs and practice. So that that would uh, would uh, and and is is released by Lexham Press in a little uh, series that is intended for wide readership. So that that would be an easy um, spoonful for somebody to to get into. Um, I've tried to write pretty much all that I've produced in book form, at least, 
uh, in a way in which it could be read and understood by somebody who is a, a book reader. You know, if they're impatient with books, they aren't going to like it. But if they if they can actually read books, they should be able to follow the discussion. Even my my huge uh, 2003 book, Lord Jesus Christ. Um, what I tried to do there was to write in ways that would make it accessible to people. And I'm very encouraged by the emails that I've had from people who are saying, hi, I'm an insurance agent in southern Indiana, and I've been reading your book, Lord Jesus Christ, and I teach Sunday school, and wow, I can understand this book. And I think that's exactly what I wanted. So it's it's intended to shape scholarly opinion, but I tried to write it in a way with, by the careful use of um, explanatory phrases and uh, notes that, that uh, explain technical terms and so on, so that they could do it. But that... That would be probably before they tackle a 600-page book, they might want to try a 60-page one and see if that is to their liking. Awesome. Well, hey, thank you so much for your time. It was it was great to have you. I feel like I've got a whole nother podcast episode worth of questions, so maybe we can do it again sometime. Okay. All right. Yeah. Nice talk. Thank, thank you. you. Yep. Yes. Have thank a great you. one. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, thanks again for listening to the Better Questions podcast. Again, don't forget to subscribe so that you can get notified each time we release a new podcast. Follow us on social media and do us a favor. If you love this episode, share it so that other people can listen to it and learn from it as well. Thanks again, and we will see you again next week.